Lord, we're so grateful for you this morning, for the ability to praise your name, to dwell in the joy that you give us. From acceptance and deliverance, Lord, we're just so grateful for that this morning. And that joy fills our hearts. The joy that we can rest in you in every situation. That you've filled us with peace and grace. And we're just really grateful for that this morning. And I pray that we would just continue to dwell with you. Continue to listen to what you have to say to us this morning. And that you would continue to move in us this morning, Lord. We love you so much. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, just an update on Ruth. I, I know Ruth is feeling better. I saw her a couple days ago. I know she's feeling better because she's bossing everybody around. And uh, half the hospital is saved now. So she's, she's yeah, that's Ruth. <laughs> that's Ruth. We missed her. When I went to go see her, she, all she talked about was the picnic on Wednesday and how much fun she had. And, and uh, we love her. And she is definitely the matriarch of our church, our eldest member. And uh, so thank you for... Uh, your prayers for her. Uh, we're finishing up uh, a line-by-line study of the 23rd Psalm. This is our last day, and we've been looking at the, the Psalm of, really, it's a Psalm about contentment, how David found contentment in the Lord. And we know David's life wasn't perfect. He made so many mistakes in his life, but he knew one thing. He knew that when he would come to the Lord and through repentance, he could restore that relationship that was broken. Uh, because of his waywardness. And we understood that he chased after God's heart. And what I love about verse 6, and this is what we're going to dive into today, is that David understood even with his waywardness at times and going through very dark times in his life, we talked about the valley of the shadow of death or those dark valleys actually being emotionally dark times for David. He knew one thing, that God would spread a table before him, that God would comfort and care for him with his rod and his staff, that God's mercy and grace would follow him, and that he knew with confidence that he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even in the midst of dark times, even with making many mistakes in his life, he had a confidence that God would remain faithful to his word. Listen, some of us need that confidence in our lives today because with the mistakes that we've made or maybe the mistakes that we've made in our past, we feel like, will God still accept me? Will God still receive me? Can I find forgiveness from the Lord? Absolutely yes. And that's what we want to look at today and looking at this beautiful psalm. Basically, a psalm is just a song. Uh, It was sung, you know, in worship to the Lord. We understood that the psalm in the Greek literally means to pluck, like plucking uh, uh, an instrument. In English, it simply means a song. And this is something that David wrote from his heart. And this is what I love about the Psalms. Many of them were written by David, but David speaks from his heart, the rawness of his heart and his relationship with God and his desire to want to know God and to follow him with all his heart. And so as we look at the 23rd Psalm, we're going to read the whole uh, Psalm uh, together. Um, What we see in this Psalm is God's provision through the eyes of a shepherd taking care of his sheep. And David understood this, taking care of his father's flock. He understood how God constantly and consistently always took care of him, always provided for him. You remember when you were young and how your parents just took care of you? You never thought as a child, you know, is the electric bill paid? You know, did you guys, did you guys pay the electric bill? You know, you never thought when you went on a trip, you know, do your kids ever ask, hey, did you put gas in the car? 
Is it, is it all set? Are we all, they don't, you just know that your parents are going to take care of you. My, my, my son and my daughter, they just got a house. They just moved in. We helped them move in on Thursday. And I'm just looking back. Kathleen and I are looking back. We're helping move in. And we're driving away. I'm thinking, they have no clue. Remember when you drive, you're like, oh my gosh, like, Wesley, here's the lawn. You're going to have to mow it sometime. You know, it's going to grow, right? You know, you know it's just, you, you, you just don't, you don't think of those things when you don't own something, uh, own it yourself. And here's what David's saying that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He will take care of me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret. So let's look at Psalm 23. We're going to read the whole psalm. We've been reading it together. I love reading the scripture together. So we're going to read this together once again. I'll have it up here on the screens for you. So Psalm 23, 1, 2, 3, let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen to God's word. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts today. For us here today that are struggling to find mercy in you, I pray they'd find mercy. For us here today that are struggling to find your provision or to see your faithfulness in our lives, I pray that we would see it today. Thank you, Lord, that our confidence is not in ourselves, but it's in you who remains faithful even when we don't see it or we might be in a season that is very difficult right now. I thank you that your goodness and your mercy and your steadfast love pursues us. It chases after us. Lord, help us today to put our confidence in you no matter what we're faced with today. We love you and we thank you for your word. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Um, so we're looking at God's presence today, that God's presence never leaves us. His, his goodness and his mercy shall follow me all the days of of my life. Um, I remember growing up, um, we, we just had a three bedroom house. So I had two sisters, so there wasn't enough bedrooms for all of us. So my parents got real creative. At one point, I had a, a bedroom in our attic, which you couldn't even stand up in. It was like, it was like a triangle, like a isosceles triangle, whatever it was. And uh, so they kind of put me in there for a while. It was pretty cool. They made it really cool. And then they, they made a bedroom for me in the basement, which was really cool. Um, I had my own bumper pool table down there. How many remember bumper pool? If you got one, let me know because I want one. I love the I love the bumper pool. I have my own record player. I could play, you know, the Bee Gees and Elvis and stuff like that. So I, it was a cool, hip little pad uh, down in the basement. I loved it. And I remember, I think I was in like sixth grade, fifth grade. I, I was really sick. I had the stomach bug, and of course, the bathroom's upstairs. My parents says, "Well, here here's a bucket." You know, here's a bowl. You got to go. You're not going to make it upstairs. So I'm like, oh, man, I was so sick. But I remember this, this, uh, this time that I had two single beds down there where I could have friends stay over. And my dad said, well, I'll stay with you. I'll sleep down in another single bed, and, and, I'll, and I'll stay with you. And, and I can remember, uh, just remember waking up during the middle of the night. I don't, I don't think I threw up anymore. I don't think my dad was probably up and down all night. I had no idea. But I remember just waking up and just seeing, um, man, I'm going to get emotional again. Stop it. Stop it, pardon. I never get emotional during my sermons. Um, <laughs> never, ever. You guys know me well. And I remember just looking, and there was something seeing my dad over there and just seeing his presence that made me feel better. This is what David is talking about, that your presence pursues me, that I know that I'm going to dwell in your house forever. All the days of my life, your mercy and your goodness pursue me. He had confidence, even though his life many times was a train wreck, he knew that God's grace and mercy would pursue him. I want you to know that, that when people go through difficult times, I know many times we're searching for the right word or the right scripture to give them, but how, and that's okay, but how many of you know that when you've gone through something very deep and traumatic in your life, you remember someone, not so much by the words they said, but by their presence, there's power in your presence. Just being there, just being there for somebody. 
And you can remember, you can think back, I remember when that person was there for me. I remember when that person just sat with me and didn't say a word, but they just sat with me. This is what David is saying. What David is saying is that your mercy and goodness, it's always there. Your presence are there. It's there for me. And I will dwell in your house. I will dwell in your presence. This was David's confidence that God would always be there for him. And so David in verse 6 shares that his goodness and his mercy will always follow us. And so every time he looked at his life, David could point to the faithfulness of God. There's comfort in knowing that the Lord is a good shepherd who will never cease caring for his sheep. And so what David does is he finished this psalm with this assurance that God never leaves us or forsakes, forsakes us. And I know David could look back over his life and he could see, God, you were faithful there. I remember when I was out taking care of the sheep and there's a predator and you gave me the strength to just to ward off anything that came that could hurt the sheep. You were there. You were faithful. You protected me. And I know it's, it's difficult for us because when you're going through something in the present, it's hard for us to remember that God was faithful in the past. Isn't that hard sometimes? Because you're like, oh, how, how am I going to get through this, God? What are you going to do? How are you going to answer this prayer? How, how is this going to be provided? Are you going to give me the provisions to make this through? And, and I love in the Old Testament, God reminded the Israelites, he says, I never want you to forget that I'm the one that brought you through the Red Sea. I'm the one that delivered you out of the hands of your enemies. I'm the one that delivered you out of, the, out of the bondage of the Egyptians. Never ceased telling your children those stories, that it was me who provided for you. It was me who gave you manna from heaven. It was me who provided water out of a rock. Don't ever forget that. Because we need to understand, if God was faithful, then he's going to be faithful in your present circumstances. And it's hard for us to remember that, but God is faithful. And this is what David is reminding himself, that your goodness, your steadfast love, your mercy is chasing after me. It's always there. And so David finishes the psalm with this assurance that God is always there. God will watch over us. He will be with us even in our darkest valley. His presence is there. And, and the word surely there is an interesting word. It, it, it means firmly established. It's, it's unwavering assurance. David knew that maybe in his life, in his bad decisions that he made, that he made a wreck of many things. But the one thing he knew is he had this, he knew for sure that God's faithfulness would firmly be established. That he could have an assurance knowing that God would be faithful to his promises. So David compares the good shepherd's enduring commitment to his flock to God's firm commitment to us. He will be faithful to his covenant that he's made to us. And so David knows that sheep are not always going to be great followers. They may stray, but the good shepherd is committed to his sheep and, do, and simply doesn't give up on them. And, and I love this story in Luke 15 where Jesus shares about a man who loses one of his sheep. You know, it's the story of the 99. He has, he has this one sheep that strays, and a good shepherd would leave the 99, to chase down that one lost sheep. And, and basically, the, the point of the parable is God cares about the lost, that he pursues them, that he wants us to pursue them. I love that in the video of our missionaries shared how God pursues the lost. No matter where they are, no matter what, what part of the world they're in, no matter what their religious background is, God pers pursues the lost through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and I love this because what, what he's telling us is that Jesus cares about those who are lost and who need to find his salvation. So Jesus tells us that the man does everything to find that one lost sheep. And they're just as important as the other 99. Now, those of you with children, I'm sure once in a while your, your child has been misplaced right? Um, that's happened to us at one time or another. We've left one child here when they're younger at church on multiple occasions. I think the Eliasons have found Wesley like five times left here at church because Kathleen thought she had them. We drove separately. They thought, I thought she had them. And then, you know, after the third or fourth time, Russ was saying, come on, you're purposely leaving him here, right? What's going on here? One time, one time he slipped out the Wesley in his diapers. I think he was 12 or 13 at the time. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> 
He slips out the back door in his diaper, and, and we're, you know, we're like, what? Kathleen's like, you know where Wesley's? I go, I don't know. The screen door's open, so he must have slipped out. So he slipped out, and, you know, our first reaction wasn't, well, oh, well, we have two other kids, you know. <laughs> My first thought, I have to admit, the gro- my first thought, I have to admit, the grocery bill is going to be a little cheaper. So I, I did think that for just a moment. But no, you frantically search for them, right? You care about them. And this is the point. This is the point. By the way, we did find Wesley. So just so you know, we did find him. But Jesus tells us that a good shepherd will do everything to search, to seek out that lost sheep. And see, the point of the parable is that Jesus cares. He cares about lost people. And this is, what, this is what David is alluding to. He's alluding to that God cares about us, that, that even in our waywardness at times, God pursues us. And that any time we can come to him and find his grace and his mercy and find forgiveness. David understood that. Read Psalm 51. It's David's repentant psalm after he was exposed that he had the, the affair with Bathsheba, but you should hear his heart and how he comes back to the Lord and he, how he wants his relationship with the Lord to be restored and to be reconciled. David understood about the mercy and the grace of God pursuing him, that it's always there, that he cares about us, that when we come to him, we can find forgiveness through our relationship with Christ Jesus and what he's done for us. And so I want you to understand that despite our doubt and lack of faith or stubbornness at times or our waywardness, God doesn't give up on us. And here's the, here's the interesting thing about God's mercy and his goodness is we don't deserve God's goodness or mercy and we don't earn it or merit it. It's there. God gives it to us freely out of his grace and his love for us that we don't merit Christ's love for us. He loves us in spite of all our weaknesses and frailties. He still loves us. And when we recognize that grace, we humble ourselves before him. And we say, I was wrong. My thinking was wrong. And we come to him with humble repentance, and God receives us and restores us. That's the beautiful thing about God's grace and mercy. So David says that the Lord's goodness and mercy will follow us. And the word goodness there implies the idea of of pleasure, of bountifulness, and cheerfulness. That goodness is there, that God is good. Even though my circumstances might not be ideal, they might not be great, we need to understand, but God is always good. He is always good. And even in not so great ideal circumstances, we can find the goodness of the Lord. We can find cheerfulness in our hearts, knowing that God is still good and he's still working in our lives. And I love that goodness, that we need to understand that God is always good. His character is good and perfect. The goodness of God is not established on my circumstances or what goes on in my life, whether good or bad. God is always good and we can trust his character. The word mercy there, I love what this word means, mercy. It means to bow the head as a sign of kindness. What David is saying is your steadfast love, it chases me. Your mercy chases me. But it's a sign of this bowing of the head as a sign of of kindness. And I I love the picture here. Um, The picture here is, and I want you to get this picture because many times you can see this. It's on many stained glass windows in churches. It was in the church that I grew up in. As you walked in to the foyer, there's a picture of Jesus with the sheep around his neck. Did you ever see that picture of the good shepherd carrying that one lost sheep? The, the, The picture, that's the picture that David wants you to see. A good shepherd, when he sees a, 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 one of his flock that's hurting or wounded, in mercy doesn't leave it there, but literally bows down and picks up that lost sheep and cares for it and nurses it back to health. That's God's mercy towards us. We don't deserve it, but when we come to him broken and bruised, his mercy bends towards us and literally picks us up and heals us of our wounds and our scars that were left behind because of sin. And we can find reconciliation in our relationship with him. And he restores us. That's the picture that David wants us to see. It's a sheep that is wounded or weak. And the shepherd with mercy bows and takes care of the wounded sheep. God's mercy bends down 
towards us. That's, what, that's the loving God that we serve. It's humbling to think that God would receive us when we don't deserve it. But David said it's this mercy and this grace that chases after us. Not only can we receive that mercy and grace, but it needs to translate to how we live our lives. So let, let me just take a side, let me just take a rabbit trail real quick here because this is so important for us to understand as followers of Jesus. If we receive that mercy and understand God's grace and we don't earn it or deserve it, right? Amen? He gives it to us as a free gift. Something's a change in our hearts. And it, it should translate in the way we treat others. See, if we are anointed in Christ Jesus, if we are changed in Christ Jesus, then he sets us apart to do his good work. And you get this picture of the Old Testament that God wanted the tabernacle anointed and all the things in the tabernacle anointed and the, and the priests anointed. Why did he do that? Well, it was a reason for setting them apart for his holy service. And when we are anointed in Christ Jesus through our salvation in him, he sets us apart for his holy service. We should be ministers of reconciliation. We should be a people that show mercy and grace to a world that so desperately needs it. And what happens is there's rhetoric out there and people, there's so, many, can, there's so many things to be angry about, isn't there? I mean, it's just so many things that we can shout at and yell at. And God says, no, I want you to be different. I want the world to look at you and say, why would you act that way? Why are you responding the way everybody else is responding? Why are you responding in grace and mercy when you shouldn't? And the reason is, for the grace and mercy that was poured out through Christ Jesus in our lives. It's humbling to realize that God would take David back when David broke pretty much all the commandments, had an adulterous affair, had a man murdered over and over, was a train wreck as a father in many ways. In many ways. How could God receive him? How could, when we look in the New Testament, looking back at David's life, actually call him a man after God's own heart? Really? That, that makes no sense. The reason why it can make sense is because David knew how to repent. David understood what it meant to have a relationship with God. Did David pay for the consequences of his bad choices? Obviously, he did. But he knew how to have that relationship with God and still knew that he could find forgiveness in his relationship with God when he came and humbled himself before him. See, understanding the cross and what Jesus Christ did for you and I, if it doesn't humble us, if the mercy and grace of God that I don't deserve doesn't humble us, then we're missing something in the gospel message. And it needs to translate in how we live it before others and how we talk to others and how we live it out before others that they can look at our lives and say, what is different about you? Why aren't you yelling? Why aren't you angry? Why aren't you screaming? And you can say, you know why? Because something's different in my heart because I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve mercy for my life. And I'm thankful for the mercy and grace that Jesus displays upon me. Paul called himself the worst of all sinners. He understood the grace that he found in Christ Jesus and he didn't deserve it either. So here's when we understand that mercy and grace, and if it chases after us, then it not only needs to be implied to the fact that we receive it, but it needs to flow out of us in the way we treat others. Amen? All right, I'm going to jump off that rabbit trail. So, okay, I'm, I'm getting off that rabbit trail. So let's understand what, what mercy truly means and how humbling it is. And so just remember, listen, do you give people the benefit of the doubt? Do we accuse before we understand the whole story? Do we seek to understand what's happening in others' lives before we make accusations? You know, it's interesting to me, when someone's really angry, ask them one question. Just say, is everything okay? Everything okay? Are you okay? What's wrong with you, right? Don't do it that way. Just say, are you okay? You know, is there anything I can pray with you about? It's amazing how people will open up. And, and how their anger, it goes much deeper to stuff that's going on in their life. And one person who just asked that one question in grace and mercy and just ask how they're doing, and if I can pray with you, it's amazing how people open up. Let's be different. Let's be those anointed people in Christ Jesus who live differently, 
who live out the mercy and grace in their lives each and every day. Okay, I jumped back on the rabbit trail. Now I'm back on the path to my message here. So God's goodness and mercy humbles us. It softens our heart. And so this word follow, when, when David uses this word follow, he means to chase after. God's goodness and mercy chases after us. It's a, it's a relentless, a never-ceasing chasing. And it's good to remember that God's mercy and goodness are with us no matter what trials may be following us or that we're in. And so what David says is, this is how I make it. This is how I get through. I understand that God is always there and I can turn to him and find his love and his mercy always behind me. It's always there. His presence is always there. Now, I love the way David ends the psalm. And he ends the psalm by saying, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What did David mean by that? Such a beautiful part of the psalm. When he means to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, David means to literally be in the presence of the Lord. See, the tabernacle, the tabernacle or the house of the Lord represented God's presence. David knew that being in God's presence meant no worries. He, he wasn't worried about his enemies. There was peace. There was no fear. There was a calm when he was in the presence of the Lord. All of life's up and downs through the darkest valleys, God leads and comforts us and eventually will lead us home to that place where we don't have to worry about all the strife in this world. So what David does is he paints this picture of God's house at being at the end of a journey. And the shepherd, when he would lead his sheep, not only would take care of his sheep out in the field, but there was an end to the journey that eventually he would lead them home. This is the picture that David wants us to understand, that God's good shepherd will lead us home, that Jesus is our good shepherd preparing our home for us, that we have this hope that we will make it, that even though we may go through all these different things in, our, in this world today and all the different you know, strife and difficulties that we may have in this world, we know that God is ultimately leading us home. And as we traverse through this world, he's going to be with us. His rod and his staff, they're going to comfort us. He's going to set a table before us. He's going to anoint our head with oil. His mercy and his grace is going to be with us that we can feel his presence in our lives, even going through the darkest valleys. He is going to be with us. But eventually, he will lead us home. And Jesus talks about this. When his, when his disciples are troubled and they're like, Jesus, you know, Jesus was talking about leaving. Eventually he's going to go to the cross to die for their sins. They're troubled because Jesus is leaving them. And so, but Jesus comforts them with these words in John 14. And I love these words. He says, listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Do you believe in God? We do. We believe in God. Do you believe also in me? Yeah, we do. We believe in you, Jesus. He says this, for my father's house has many rooms, many dwelling places, many mansions. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And the way you know to the place of where I'm going, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. There's a dwelling place that Jesus is preparing for his followers. David understood this as dwelling in the presence of the Lord forever. That this is our hope. That our hope isn't in this world. Our hope isn't what we see in front of us right now. But ultimately our hope is in that place that Jesus is preparing for every single one of his followers. So how do we traverse through this world? How do we find contentment in this world through all the things that we might go through? Here's how we find contentment. We know that God is good. We know that God is faithful. We know that his mercy, his steadfast love, and his grace chases after us. And through all those things, David says, listen, you anoint my head with oil. You prepare a table before us. And what David is saying there is, God, through all those things, even through the darkest valley, even through my emotional struggles, I'm blessed. I'm still blessed. 
even in these struggles, I'm still blessed because I know you're using all these things for your purposes and your glory and I can still trust you. And, and the, the cherry on the Sunday is I get to be with you forever where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more New York state taxes. Praise God, hallelujah, thine the glory. Um, we're gonna be with him forever. So listen, even in your struggle, can I say this? We're blessed. We are so blessed beyond measure to have a Savior that receives us, who loves us, who cares for us, who never leaves us or forsakes us. That doesn't mean your situation. You don't call your situation good when it's bad. It's bad, right? We all go through bad. It's not like Jesus saying, well, fake it out and just say you're blessed anyways. It's a, but what you can say, the situation's bad. But I can still say God is good. And I can still say I'm blessed because I know my Savior. And I know that there's an endless supply of his grace and mercy to help me to endure where I can say I'm blessed. And I know I can trust you. And I know you're good. And I know you're going to see this thing through. And I know one day I'll be with you. Now I hope I hope when I get to heaven, I'm not reminded of all the little things I worried about and wasted my days upon, right? I hope I don't get to heaven where it's like, man, I spent so much time worrying about these things that never amounted to anything, right? So in our days here, when we're, we're traversing through difficult times, remind yourself that in Christ Jesus, we're blessed. There's a peace there's a joy, there's a calmness, there's a peace that we can get in God's presence that this world cannot give us. David understood about the presence of God. He spent a lot of time in the field with sheep, right? A lot of alone time with God. But you could, you could hear it, you can see it in David's writing that he knew God. God's done everything possible to reach us through his son, Jesus. So Jesus experienced all your pain, all your suffering. He faced it for you. We have a perfect savior in every way, a perfect high priest that can sympathize with all your weaknesses. We know that Jesus was without sin, but he understands what you're going through and you can find grace and mercy to find help in your time of need. He wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. That's the presence of the Lord, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Find yourself in his presence, and you will find his blessings, because <laughs> we are blessed beyond measure to have a Savior who loves us in spite of us and all our idiosyncrasies, amen? <laughs> all our weirdness, right? He still loves us. And I'm grateful that he receives us and he takes us back every time. We can find his mercy and his grace. That's the good shepherd we serve. That's the 23rd Psalm. Father God, we just come before you we are so undeserving of your mercy and your grace. You've done everything to reach us. And I pray, God, for those that are struggling to find your mercy, I pray, Lord, that they would realize it's nothing they deserve. It's a free gift that God gives us that they, we can run and find mercy in you. I pray for those who are doubting your care for them because of what they're going through. I pray, Lord, that they would understand your promises are true, that we can cast all our cares at your feet because you do care for us, and we can find mercy and grace in our time of need. Lord, I pray that we would hold on to the truth of your word, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that even through our darkest valleys, we would know that you are with us. 
that your rod and your staff, they comfort us, that you prepare a table before us, that you anoint our head with oil, that your mercy and grace, they follow us, and that we will dwell in your house, in your presence forever. That's the promise we have. So thank you, Lord, that your word doesn't disguise or, ha- or hide the difficult things that people have gone through in their lives. But it's through those situations, I believe, that you are most glorified and that we can experience you in the most intimate way. So Lord, we come to you and we ask for your mercy. We come to you and we ask for your provision. We come to you and we ask for your peace in our lives. And we thank you that we can find it through your son, Jesus. Allow us to be faithful to you, Lord, because you're so faithful to us. We love you and we thank you for your word. We give you the glory, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God for his word? He's so faithful. Amen. Listen, as we close in prayer today, if you need God's mercy, reach out for it. He's a forgiving God. If you're struggling with God's provision in your life, reach out to God. Say, God, I need you to help me to trust you through whatever you're going through that I know you're going to provide. Trust him with that. Be assured with that unwavering confidence that God is faithful to meet your needs. And let's just worship him. Can we do that? And let's thank him for his faithfulness today. So as we sing this last song, let this be your prayer. We want to pray for you too. If you need any prayer today, we want to pray for you. We'll, you know, if you want to come up during the song, I'll be up front, Pastor Brandon. We'd, we'd love to pray for you with whatever you're going through. But let's just worship the Lord and just thank him for his goodness. Amen? Amen. So let's stand, if you're able, and let's sing this unto the Lord. God bless you.
Father God, we are so grateful that we can run to you again and again and again and find your mercy and your grace. Restore us where we feel broken. Restore us, God, where we feel lost. Give us confidence again, God, where we feel like we've lost your presence. Give us confidence today and that assurance knowing that you will provide. We may not know how, we may not know when, but we know that you've been faithful in the past. You'll be faithful in the future. Help us to trust you with that as we lay that at your feet. So we thank you for your word today. Lord, I pray that as we wake up tomorrow on the next day, that Lord, we can know and understand that you are faithful. That your mercies are new every single morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We love you today. May we go in your strength and your peace now. For it's in Jesus' name and Jesus' name alone, we ask all these things. We ask all these things. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord today. He's so good. He's so good. God bless you guys. Remember next week, 10 a.m. And uh, have a great week. We love you guys. And we'll see you next week. God bless you.